Do you think there are certain qualities that allow people to succeed in tight, uncomfortable, broken situations? Yes. And I think number one is not assuming the worst out of someone. If someone would, and and to this day, I mean, I got a comment this morning about, um, you know, being a woman and being a fake and being, uh, I'm trying to be something I'm not, whatever, whatever Whatever it was, it was, it was hateful. It doesn't make me mad. I just realized, hey, this guy's never met a Lisa Jaster. Maybe I should engage him and see if maybe the issue is he just can't fathom who I am or what I want to do. And um, yeah, there's a there's a way to bring people around, I guess. Mm. Interesting. When I think about success, I often think about discipline and execution, but I don't know if I've often thought about the other aspects. Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the show. If you have not done your blood work yet, it is time. There are no excuses and you got to get this done. In fact, it is a non-negotiable for me. Why? Number one, You have no idea what is going on under the hood until you get your blood work. And this is the number one thing people put off. And it is probably the most important thing to do because you have to see how your lifestyle is actually impacting your health and wellness. Inside Tracker is a company that has been created by scientists, experts in aging, genetics, biometrics. You can choose whichever plan you like and you will get a whole host of biomarkers that are critical, just to name a few, things like ApoB, which is critical for heart health. You've heard me talk about that before. I I did a whole episode with Dr. Mike Twyman, as well as three other hormone markers that are especially important for addressing symptoms related to aging. Inside Trackers added insulin. Insulin is related to muscle health. You guys need to know these key biomarkers. Most importantly, for a limited time only, you will get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. That's insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. Lisa Jaster, thank you so much for coming on the show. And by the way, it's always amazing when I get to have my friends on the show. Thanks for having me. Yes. Um, you are just not any friend. You are a woman who graduated Ranger School, one of the first three women to graduate Ranger School, also a West Point graduate, a soldier, an engineer, a mom, wife. And a wife. And yeah. a wife. Yeah. I, yeah I, That's the amazing. easiest one to put at the end of the list, which I, I'm working on right now, actually. <laughs> Pretty incredible. You are extraordinary. And I wanted to bring you on to share your story. I want to hear I want to hear all about you and also what makes you you which is kind of like this nebulous question but tell me a woman going through ranger school a soldier tell us a little bit about your background So I grew up in a really small town in Wisconsin I don't know if we want to go all the way back yeah. <laughs> Well we can force uh, fast forward to I know that you've always wanted to be a soldier that you yes. wanted to be a soldier since yes. you were 7th seventh seventh grade, grade. yeah 7th yes. grade I was inspired I wanted to go um I decided in 7th grade I was going to go to West Point and um so I worked towards that goal starting in seventh grade with a few missteps along the way. I was not necessarily a good teenager or completely focused, but I did get there. Um, while I was at West Point, one of the interesting things for me is being one of the first women to go to Army Ranger School, I never had a burr under my saddle about not being allowed to do things. It just was the way it was. I wasn't trying to be a first at anything. I just wanted to be the best I could be at whatever opportunities were were kind of thrown in my face. And so fast forwarding through West Point, I tried to do sports and activities that would feed into being a good soldier, uh, which included being on the Army martial arts team, primarily that, um, which was a lot of fun and has carried through. I'm 45 now and still doing martial arts. So not the chess team. Not the, the chess right. team. But honestly, now that I do play chess, I learned because my kids learned that would have helped me with tactics quite a bit. Um, 
absolutely excellent activity to do with my children. Of course, they beat me almost daily. But uh, again, back to, to West Point. So when I graduated, I wanted to be an engineer because I thought that was the closest to the fight for a female other than military police and the garrison mission. So the mission that we did when we weren't in a combat environment was also extremely useful and it translated into the civilian world. So so when I saw the first Gulf War, um, I was watching TV and I thought, these people aren't acting. They're not pretending. They're actual heroes. And we watched all these war movies growing up, whether you had a dad who liked John Wayne or you were in the um, Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger genre family. There were always war movies. And, and these people weren't pretending. They weren't acting like they were going to help people, they were actually helping people. And they were actually willing to, even if they didn't see combat, they were willing to sacrifice their life if that's what they were called to do. And it just seemed like a, ho a higher calling. So I'm, I'm a Christian, big fan of the idea of having a higher calling, a higher purpose in life. And being in the military seemed like it was a, a reason to live, not just a job. I think that's really interesting because a lot of women maybe want to join the military, but the idea is often that they don't want to necessarily be soldiers. So there's a common misconception, too, that we're all war fighters. And there is this clash where people who have done things like your husband has done or like my you mean the partner. dishes <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. he definitely didn't do that yeah. or my husband he's he's a marine and you hear the stories you see the war movies and you think oh warriors and then there's this back and forth within uniform service members that anyone who isn't out in front fighting the fight is a pogue or um which stands for i don't even know people i think it's um it, it's it's the people who yeah. aren't Right. Doing something the about war support. fighting stuff. Something about yes. support. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and we have FOBITs, which the FOB is the forward operating base. And those are the people that go to war and then never leave the protective barriers. And there's a lot of people who do that. And there's this misconception that somehow they're not as critical to the military as the people out there who are the tip of the spear, who are out there fighting, who are out there doing the individual one-on-one um, -on -one contact or unit-on-unit -unit contact. But something that was learned early in World War I is if you want to defeat another military, you cut off their supply lines. You hit them in the rear with the gear. If people can't get food, if they can't get fuel, they can't win wars. So when you have someone who might be a smaller person, male or female, and they're like, well, I can't hump a 90, I can't carry or hump a 90 pound pack. Um, sorry, a little bit mil military vernacular, but I can't carry that 90 pound pack with me through the woods. Well, you don't have to, to be value add to our military services. And even now, or especially now with drones, some of the kids who grew up playing Xbox, not that I advocate gaming right, at right. all. I really don't. It's um, If that's something you love to do, good for you. No, but, turn it off, people. Yes, go outside, get give grass me, in your feet. Me, yeah, like, come on. But those people are huge added value for the Air Force. And some of these, the as the war becomes more digital, we need those skill sets. And you think of those people and you think of pale skin and not a lot of muscle and but they can add value as well as soldiers. When you decided to become a soldier, did you want to go fight a war? I did. I didn't want us to be at war, but I did want to be part of the tip of the spear, whatever that looked like. When you went to West Point, was that how, – how was that? So West Point, for people who don't know, if you could uh, highlight – I know what the Naval Academy is and West Point is the – opposite of, right? It's kind of like the sister school, right? Am I butchering this? Yes. Every day <laughs> yes out of the year. This. Yes. No, no. Every day of the year, we absolutely love our brothers and sisters in the <laughs> Navy, except for Army Navy. It's the first weekend in December. I promise you, like, I will not we're be not talking. talking yeah, to you. We're, we're not, not talking. talking. Yeah. Okay. We're just not. Well, unless you want shaving cream in your yeah, car. No, definitely. It's, unless it's just you're going to clean it now. Yes. Yes. Um, but Actually, the person who graduates last in our class in ranking, we call the GOAT, which is the mascot of the Naval Academy. So that's that's how much love there is there. Um, but yeah, so West Point is the Army's um, 
school, college commissioning source. Uh, we often say that the history you read was written by our graduates um, because a lot of our graduates, you've got your your patents and your uh, your Schwarzkopf's and you know there's there's a long line of history from uh, West Point graduates. But it is a military school, so you leave from your high school less than 30 days after graduating high school. You spend your whole first summer doing basic training. Then you go into the school year. The whole time you're there, you're under military regulations. You wear a uniform the entire time. Your summers are taken up with military training. When um, most college kids are coming home for Christmas break, you're at military intercession learning small unit tactics. So I went there um, – really wanting to be as military as I could. And I started off thinking, okay, well, based on being a woman and wanting to be um, use my mind, be an intellectual, I want to go military intelligence. I actually really thought that that was the the field for me. But as I learned more about the Army, um, I did get graduate with a degree in civil engineering. And I realized that I could go somewhere where there was nothing and build something that lasts forever. And I could do it with the military. So that means I can do um, service projects, which the military does a lot of that. We go into um, communities that need rebuilding and we help build them up, whether it's improving water systems, improving structures. Or I could go and be a combat engineer, which is another part of that. And those are the people who do the demolitions and they do they they blow stuff up and they clear lanes or they clear minefields so that the infantry can move forward. Um, there's even a joke among combat arms that uh, the infantry guys always say that infantry leads the way and then engineers reply only after we clear it for you. <laughs> what did you do after you graduated from West Point? And do you graduate as an officer? Yes. So everyone who graduates from West Point is commissioned as a second lieutenant or an O1 one in the United States Army. Um, and then so from there, you have usually like a month, maybe two months of a break, and then you have to go into training and you owe mandatory of five years active duty service, and then three years of inactive ready reserve, which are the people that they can call up. Um, I don't know if you heard in the news recently, they're calling up the Coast Guard IRR inactive ready reserve, and having them backfill some some Navy troops. But uh, yeah, so you have an eight-year obligation after graduating. And then there's just a constant tie back to the school. What did you do when you graduated? Where'd you go? So I went to um, the officer basic course at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And then soon thereafter, I got stationed at Fort Stewart, Georgia, which it's outside of Savannah. Absolutely gorgeous place to be stationed. But you went overseas too. I did. I did. So um, I was commissioned in 2000 and then September 11th occurred. So... Very soon after September 11th, my unit started deploying soldiers to Afghanistan. I went over after the new year. I went to Afghanistan. We came back and then we actually deployed again to Iraq. So I went to Operation Enduring Freedom One, which was Afghanistan, and then Operation Iraqi Freedom One, which was in Iraq. Then after that, the Army paid for me to go to graduate school, get my master's in civil engineering. So I truly am an engineer. Mm -hmm. um, I've watched concrete dry and take. And I took pictures of it, actually. Yeah, that is uh, unusual, <laughs> somewhat weird and unusual. But um, when you were over there, what did you do? Your job was as an engineer? So the military's changed a bunch. Um, now we have uh, route clearance and area clearance, which means we go out to either like roadways or a big section of land and we clear it for unexploded ordnance, mines, whatever else might be in the area. Back then, we didn't have that. That was our first exposure to these IEDs and non-conventional warfare. There wasn't a front line and a rear area. So when I was in Afghanistan and Iraq, we actually up armored our bulldozers. So we armor plated bulldozers in 114 degree weather, stuck a guy in full kit with Kevlar in that and said, hey, go drive around and see if you can blow up any of the mines that are out there. And ideally, you would identify them and not blow them up and then bring in the, the ordinance guys to, to blow them up and guys and gals uh, to blow them up in place. But more often than not, you had a mine rake and the you would detonate that way. So that was one of the things we did. And then I got to um, build roadways, airfields, um, build up the camp. My platoon did a lot of convoy missions. We occupied perimeter positions. So my guys were even in foxholes. So I just wanted to dispel any rumors that um, 
Yes, women weren't on the front lines necessarily back in 2001, 2002, but we weren't hidden either. We were still out there um, every day out on convoys, out getting exposed to. I mean, this is a, a you are a polarizing guest uh, for which I love. Thank you. And, I mean, I also love you and adore you as a human, but this is a very polarizing topic, this idea of women in the military, but not so much women in the military, but women in special operations community, yes. special forces community. And, and rightly so. There's just a lot of culture, a lot of history that kind of goes into all that. And the goal of this podcast is really for people to get to know you. You are extraordinary. I mean, I, you and I were joking. I, I could definitely not make it through ranger school. I couldn't. And I couldn't make it through medical school. So <laughs> I mean, we're you good. probably we're could. That there. is much easier than ranger school. And there's just a lot of, and, and I was reading your book and I was just thinking to myself, why would you put yourself through this? And there's lots of hard things that we do, but this is a different kind of hard. Going at, as a female going into ranger school, and I, I think you said that there were 19 at the time, you were one of the first three to graduate in the history of ranger school. And again, I know you didn't set out to be the first, but it is not a comfortable experience. And I say that so lightly to be in an environment where your fellow soldiers, uh, you've always wanted to be in the military, you trained up to be a teammate, are looking at you thinking, you know, I mean, at least outwardly, some people are like, get out of here. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, why, why ranger school? So I didn't want to go to ranger school. It, oh. it actually wasn't on my to-do list. And I was contacted and was uh, somebody said, my SAR major, and for anyone who doesn't know, SAR major is your senior enlisted advisor. So you got your officers and you got your enlisted. And this is the guy who, if you ask him anything, he's been in the army long enough to know everything. And if he doesn't know, he'll fake it and make you believe that he knows it. And uh, SAR major Robbie Payne, uh, I think he hates how much I mention his name now. He wrote me, he's like, hey, listen, uh, army's going to open up ranger school to women some of us were talking. I don't know who the some of us were, um, but I'm sure none of it was a good conversation, but we think you should go. And he sends me this via email and I just wrote him back. I'm like, sorry, Major, that's great. I like room service. Like literally, I'm, I'm at that point in my life. I was 36 going on 37, two kids, amazing husband, great job. I took a King Air plane to my project sites. Like drink coffee on the way. There was a land cruiser waiting for me when I got there. Like I don't want to live in the woods, and unless I'm camping and maybe even then, glamping. Yeah, you, you know, even like, then you don't want to live yeah. in the woods. Yeah, yeah. I like I like my coffee every day. If nothing else, I, I could coffee. not deploy. There's no Starbucks around here. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> Standing joke. So my um, Star Major Payne didn't get anywhere with me. So he communicated with my husband and my husband, I love him and hate him for this simultaneously, but he kind of cornered me and he was like, why wouldn't you go? And he quoted one of my favorite quotes back to me, which is Einstein saying, um, a ship is safest at the shore, but that's not what it was built for. And he's like, baby, you were built for this. Like, think of your life. Think of the 36 years you've had. You don't have a chip on your shoulder. You have the support system. You've been deployed. You've got a combat action badge. You've earned a bronze star. You've done these things. Like, you're not, you're not coming in here and you're not going to be naive. You're not going to care if somebody gets in your face. Shaving your head is just another day. I was like, I really don't want to run five miles in 40 minutes. Like, in all honesty, I would rather – my cardio is lifting weights faster. I do not want to run. And he was like, well, we can get you there, but you really need to do this. So I went to Facebook, and overwhelmingly, my friends were supportive. And so – Did you do a poll and say, hey, should I go to Army Ranger School or not? Did you think about potentially the repercussions and the impact that it would have on you, your family, if any? I did to a point. Um, I I didn't think it would go this far because I really thought that there would be swarms of women that were younger than me that would succeed with the invention of CrossFit and the popularity of it. Now, granted, this was 2014. I attended in 2015. So this was fall of 2014. CrossFit was huge. A bunch of us were doing it. There was more women in jujitsu. You just saw so many strong women out there, especially in the military. We were fighting two wars publicly, and there's all the other skirmishes that are going on in the background that aren't highly publicized. But, you know, there's enough people out there. I thought, well, there's there's going to be plenty of women that want to go and graduate. I'm just going to be one of many. Uh, and that was actually an interesting thing, too, because 
all they asked, all the army asked for was your social security number if you were interested. Like send an email to this inbox with your social security number saying, I'm interested in going to ranger school. And the reply was so overwhelming. We had to compete for slots. And then for only three to graduate, it was actually pretty surprising to me. How many people go to ranger school? Each class is about 100, or each class starts with almost 400 people, depending. That's a big class. It is, but you, like my class graduated, mm -hmm. I think it was in the, it was, ugh, I should have read my own book. Because no. uh, I got curious. all the numbers yeah, in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. It was either 68 or 86, and I can't remember right, right now. But not, but. But less than, less than 50%, the year I went, less than 50% of the people who started graduate, um, which is a much higher graduation rate than like buds. But. It is a significant drop. How many women, 2015 was the first time that they opened Ranger School to women. Yes, ma'am. Was it the last time? No, it's still open. It's still 120 open. some odd women have graduated since then. There's now women in Ranger Battalion. Um, I, I've heard of other women doing other things, but because of the kickback and the response that we received, um, the I don't know if it's the government or the individuals are trying to keep those names out of the press as much as possible because women like me just want to do their job like I don't I don't want to be a female ranger school graduate I wanted to go to ranger school so I could be a better engineer officer so I could do the job that my male peers are doing with the same information with the same level of training and that's what I think is so amazing when you read the book and when you and I talk it actually had nothing to do with you being a woman wanting to do this thing it was how could it make you a better human? Yes. How could it make you actually a better soldier? Yes. And is that where the name Delete the Adjective came from? Yes, indirectly. So in 2016, President Obama had his final State of the Union. And I was invited um, with several other people to be a guest of Michelle Obama. So the president's spouse has a box at the State of the Union. They invite certain people who have been, they think, influential in the last year. And I was invited. And Alan, I was allowed to bring a guest. And my husband, Alan, said, you know, I don't really want to go. I'll take care of the kids. I'll stay home. It wasn't a political statement. wasn't anything. The uh, person I invited instead was a LGBTQ activist. And... Um, but she was also one of the first women to graduate from West Point in the class of 1980. She was extremely helpful throughout Ranger School. She is also um, a politician. She's done a lot of navigating the D.C. area. And my number one fear is I'm a soldier. Um, I'm a soldier. I'm a mom. I'm a wife. I'm all these things. But a politician, I'm not. And I didn't want to have to navigate those very, very shark infested waters without somebody by my side who could tell me, hey, talk here, be quiet here, walk here, don't do this. And so I invited Sue um, as my guest. And we were standing in line getting, you know, wanded down or whatever to get into the West Wing. And um, there was a newspaper article that was published. And it was something about Lisa Jast, our first female Army Reserve Ranger School graduate invites LGBTQ activists. And I say that because the IA plus or whatever wasn't part of it back in 2015. And so um, I'm reading this article and I'm just thinking, oh my gosh. And Sue's like, yeah, you didn't invite me because I was gay or an activist, did you? I'm like, I invited you because you're my friend and I thought you would be fun to go to this thing with. And she goes, yeah, sometimes people need to just delete the adjective. And so that was January 2016. And it just kind of stuck. Like, why am I friends with you? I'm friends with you because I can talk to you about um, your husband, your job, your being a mom, I can talk to you about your house. Like I'm friends with you because of the whole person. Any one of those is great, but they're just adjectives. Like I want to be friends with the whole person. So delete the adjective kind of came from that. And then obviously it it fits very well with the Ranger School story. I have been told I should change the title only because it sounds like an English lit book, but I I love it. I think it's very suiting. You went, so you went to Ranger School 2015. At the time, there were 19 women, mm -hmm. 19 slots. So 21 women. So the men don't have to go through pre-Ranger, but because men usually have a pre-Ranger train up at their home units, um, they, 
they thought, well, let's try to make it even playing ground for the women. So we're going to send them to a two-week pre-ranger school called RTAC. It's Ranger Training and Assessment Course. And for the women to receive a slot to ranger school, they had to graduate RTAC. Again, this isn't a requirement for men. Um, so there's been a lot of publicity about the fact that we had different standards. And yes, we did. We had to we had to graduate pre-ranger. Probably under a lot of scrutiny, more scrutiny than somebody else. Yes. And, and part of the negative of that is the women's hair standard in the military is different than the men's. So the ranger standard was to cut it, cut your hair to the shortest allowable standard. For women, that was a quarter inch. For guys, it's a shaved head. So even day one, we stuck out because we had hair and they didn't. I mean, it wasn't even the fact that we looked different or we we were mostly more petite. Some of those guys are not – they're not any bigger than me, we'll say. Um, but, you know, we've got different voices. We stuck out significantly, which means – and this is nothing against ranger instructors. They picked on us, but it, they didn't pick on us because we were women. They picked on us because we stuck out. And if you look into a sea of people and there's one black person, everybody notices the black person. It's not because we're all racists. It's because – he sticks out. And I think that's something that um, I had to get really comfortable with. And being 37 at the time was actually helpful because when they picked on me, I realized it was the fact that my voice was a different tone. So they zeroed in on me. I had hair and the guys didn't. So the women had to graduate this RTAC. I think there was like 20 slots per class for four different iterations. If 80 of us went through, there was up to 60 slots for women reserved in the April Ranger School class. So we were competing for 60 slots. Only 21 women actually graduated from RTAC. Two of them, one decided she didn't want to go to Ranger School. And then one, I think, broke her ankle. So only 19 of us showed up on the first day. Were you guys all friends? I didn't know. I knew one of them because she was in my RTAC class and I had saved her cell phone number. And I kept asking her, and we're still friends today. Uh, hey, Chris. Uh, but so Chris Grice, she was actually one of the first women to graduate from Ranger School. She was the only one I knew when I showed up on day zero. What were you thinking going into it? <sighs> I was actually more concerned about what it would do to my family. I wasn't really concerned about my military career. At that point, I had gotten out of the military for five years came back in as a reservist and the army was something fun I did in addition to working for Royal Dutch Shell. But my kids were of that young age where in my mind they needed their mother. Um, but luckily I I did my due diligence and I married the right man. Mm. And I don't know that they even noticed I was gone. Other than the fact that he manscaped the house a little bit. Oh, uh, wow. He removed the coffee table, put in a wrestling mat so that he could have the kids, hey, you guys go practice your jits while I make dinner. Um, very, yeah. very good. Good job, Alan. Good, good job. job. <laughs> you weren't thinking, this is going to be hard. I need to be courageous. What if I suck? You didn't, I, you were just thinking, okay, this is cool. I'm going to, what are some of the skills that you learn at ranger school for people that have never heard of what a ranger is or what you learn in ranger school? What was it that you were doing? I think at ranger school, there's a misconception that ranger school is a school. Like you're going to, you're going to get educated, but the truth is it's a test. And when you graduate, it's more of a certification than it is in education because what happens is we're all good. When we're like this, hair, makeup, good night's sleep, cup of coffee in you, everybody's good. What if you can't have coffee for nine straight weeks? What if you haven't slept for more than 45 minutes a night? The average day at ranger school is 19 and a half hours long. So you learn these tactics, but they're tactics. They're small unit tactics. The, it's things that you've already learned. Everybody in the military, from Coast Guard, Navy, we all know how do you move through the woods? How do you walk quietly? How do you camouflage yourself in whatever environment you work in? These are all basic military skills. Well, now we're going to test you by putting you in charge of whether it's five, 15, or a platoon of you know 30 some odd people who are all equally as tired. They've been walking around with 70 pounds on their back. In a typical ranger school, which is nine weeks long, you walk on average 200 miles. The rucksack is on average 70 pounds, which means sometimes it's 50, but 
Most times it's like 80 or 90. And that's 200 miles in 19 and a half hour days. And that includes those days when, hey, we're jumping out of airplanes tomorrow. So they have to give you eight hours of rest. So the nights are skewed where some nights are 15 minutes of sleep so that you can have eight hours of sleep before your jump night or jump day. So what did I learn at Ranger School? It was, do I really have the metal I thought I had when I'm tested? You know, it's blanks. They can't they can't shoot live rounds at us. That would be stupid. Yeah. Um, they shouldn't. Give... That would really limit the yes military. Um, they can't. We're sleep deprived, so you know they don't want to give us live ammunition or send us to ranges. So they can't test us on the military skills we get tested on um, outside in our regular units. What they do is it's got fake munitions, but you're exhausted and you're hungry and every part of your body is sore as you're walking through the woods. And for weeks after you graduate, you have an interesting stench about you because your body actually starts digesting your own muscle mass to be to survive. And the guys come out, um, and I specifically say the guys being gender specific, they come out looking like they were locked in a basement for a month. Now, one of the under, other interesting things that comes in the controversial side is my face was still not very gaunt when I graduated. And so there was rumors that I was getting more food or I got more sleep or I got to come in for more showers. As a doctor, you understand that a 37-year-old female does not burn calories like a 22-year-old male. So where the guys were losing 15, 20 pounds, I lost four. And then the next iteration, they'd lose another 10 pounds. I lost two. Then they lost another. We had guys that lost upwards of 50 pounds and I lost... 15. Mm. Again, 37. Trust me, I try to lose weight all the time. It never works. That is, I mean, it's just fascinating. But then they shouldn't really call it ranger school. They should probably call it ranger selection. Yeah, maybe. Because it really is. Um, I had somebody explain it to me because the grading standards. There was questions, hey, can we see the grading standards that the women were graded at? Now, those cards are never kept because they are so individual. They're individual to the instructor. They're individual to the student. They're individual to the position. Um, you could walk through the woods here and walk through the woods by my house, which is separated by 250 miles. And it's a completely different experience because I live in the hill country. So you and I automatically wouldn't be graded the same because it's just every scenario is different. So with that, there's there are grading standards, but the true standard to graduate is, could I trust you to have my back in a foxhole if we were stuck out in the middle of nowhere and all I had was you? Thank you to First Form for sponsoring this episode of the show. Today, I would love to highlight First Form's meal replacement protein powder. Now, depending on when you're listening to this episode, I am actually going to go out on a limb and say... Pumpkin spice latte is in the house. Why am I telling you about this? Because if you have cravings, because of course, around this time of year, there's all kinds of goodies as we are going to be entering into October and then of course, December and January, people always, always go off their diet. You're going to plan for your weaknesses. And one way to do that is to pick delicious type foods or powders to augment your weakness. What does that mean? It means planning for where you possibly will fail. Here's one way we do it. We use first form level one, blend it up and put it in the freezer. It is a protein powder. It has about 140 calories per scoop and it is a protein matrix comprised of whey and milk protein concentrate. Tastes delicious. You can make it into an ice cream and stay on your nutrition plan. And by the way, they have tons of different flavors like chocolate banana, chocolate marshmallow. They're always coming up with something different. Head on over to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion and try their level one meal replacement protein powder. And if I could answer yes, then you deserve to graduate from ranger school. Now, there, there are standards to make sure it's not a good old boy system or good old gal system, however you want to refer to it. But there are standards to make sure it's not a good old boy system. But that's really the underlying goal is I'm going to test you to see if I can trust you when you're tired and hungry and going through whatever it is you're going through in your personal life. Can I still trust that you're going to lead and make the right decisions? What makes a good leader? I think 
Number one is leading the individual. Now, in the military, you have to lead a unit. But if you're leading a unit of five guys, you talk to those five guys at their level. If you're leading a squad of 12 or a platoon of 40, you talk to them at their level, what they need to hear, how they need to hear it. And I think being able to communicate in a way that your audience can hear you, regardless of the size, is critical. If you're the secretary of the army, you can't sit there and talk about the little eaches. You have to talk big picture. You have to talk strategy. If you are a unit commander, you have to talk at a organizational level. You have to talk about operations. Strategy doesn't matter to necessarily the people at your level unless it's just a good to know. But when you're at that small unit tax tactics, which is what Ranger School is testing, you have to speak to the individual. You have to speak at that tactical level. So can you, when you're tired and hungry and you don't want to be there anymore and you haven't slept in a bed in three weeks, can you still talk to these people in a way that they can hear you and they can execute your intent regardless of how you're projecting? So um yeah, I think when you're talking about leadership, leadership is really knowing your audience and knowing how to motivate them. What was it like for you? So take us through, I don't know if it's a day, because I was reading your book and it sounds like there are phases. Yes. There were phases. Sometimes you were in charge, sometimes you're not, or you guys flip flop. Take me through a, a scenario. So Ranger School has three major phases, but the first thing you do is you have to graduate RAP week. And RAP is the Ranger Assessment phase. So that's the first four days. Um, yes, it's called week and it's four days. Military math, I don't know. But that's all these individual tasks to make sure that you are physically capable of making through the school without hurting yourself. So push-ups, sit-ups, run, water obstacle course. We can't have people um, going through the swamps who can't swim. Uh obstacle courses as a whole, rock marches, rock runs, lots of land navigation, just individual skills to make sure that you can handle yourself in the woods. Past that, great. Um, just to give a dynamic of what that looks like, we showed up on day zero. Day one was the physical fitness test. We started with 398, 399 people. A quarter of those people didn't make it to breakfast on the first day. And that's a four-day assessment phase. So... Um, if you get through, if you don't get through that, you go home. No questions asked. Then you have your three phases, which is the crawl, walk, run. And crawl is in Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, walk is in Dahlonega, Georgia. And then your run is in Florida. And a typical scenario is in the early phases, you're in charge of a team or a squad. So maybe five, maybe 12. And you have an assigned duty. And so if you're the lead squad, you're doing land navigation. If you're the weapons squad, you've got all the big guns. Super fun stuff. It's fun to be uh, the weapons squad, except the fact that you have to carry those big guns all day through the woods along with everything else. If you're in a leadership position, your job is to make sure you don't lose anyone, which is a really big deal at ranger school. And it's a really big deal when you're out there um, in an actual uh, military operation. Can you keep accountability of a bunch of people who are droning? And when I say droning, I mean, they're literally walking around like there's no human behind those eyeballs. Can you keep them moving in the right direction, keep everybody together, keep them um, doing their job they're supposed to do? And then whether you're in a leadership or you're an individual person, um, just member of squad, you're reacting to artillery rounds coming at you. You have somebody attacks you at, at least once a day. You get an attack from opposition forces or people pretending to be enemy. And then the culminating event is you actually com complete either a reconnaissance mission or you attack somebody or you set up an ambush. There's, there's some sort of mission at the end of the day. And then finally, you get graded on setting up your, your patrol base, which is where you refeed and plan for the next day, maybe rest if you get a chance to sleep and uh, so it start very, all over. Sounds very relaxing. Yes. Yes. It's <laughs> like going to the spa. Yeah. It sounds very relaxing. What were the other soldiers? What was their influence on you? Because again, reading this book, I, you know, it's one thing to be able to execute in a way where it doesn't matter what people think you know, me, as we're doing this podcast, there's going to be people that love this podcast and there's going to be people that hate it, but it's not people directly in my face right. and not um, with them for nine weeks. I'm not, 
you know, these are not my teammates. Right. I'm, I'm sure some of them wanted you to succeed and some did not. Yes. And didn't understand why you were there. And again, this is a very, for those not in the military community or, or kind of in that environment, this is very polarizing. How did you, number one, what were some of the experiences that you had and how did you navigate or process that? The guys who were there. So first and foremost, above all else, the 40-somethings or the late 30s, like we know somebody who fits every category. You know that person who's retired professional athlete, has their second career, and you're like, wow, look at all the stuff you've done. But at 22, I didn't know that person. I didn't know somebody who was worldly, intellectual, and athletic, and this, and that. So these these young cats are coming in and all they're being told leading up to this integration is, oh my God, don't let a woman graduate. That would be terrible. Well, ranger school, like life, is a team sport. Like everything in the military, it's a team sport. We started the podcast talking about without logisticians, the, the guys with the guns don't have bullets. So they can't fight the wars without, without their backup. And so we'd get there and after you did a few air squats and you did some burpees and you did all these other physical fitness requirements, hey, um, somebody didn't make it on time to formation. Everybody do 100 jumping jacks. Like by the time we got there and my classmates looked at me and the other women and were like, wait a minute, the women are doing all the jumping jacks and they're getting noticed more because they stick out because of their size, their voices, their hair. So we're getting more attention than most of the guys, which means we can't fake it. We can't kind of fade into the background. Okay, the women not only are doing the same thing we are, but they're doing it under a more watchful eye. It took probably less than 24 hours for our classmates in general to accept us. Now, there was a couple of them that would really fight the fast. good fight. Really? really fast. Why? Be Why? Because if oh, told you, should have definitely taken that off. No, just kidding. Um, because if... If I dropped my rucksack, let's say we were holding our bags over our head doing uh, what we call Y squats, where you make a Y with your arms and you squat with whatever you're holding over your head and you do a bunch of it. If I drop my bag, everybody gets punished for it. Well, the women were getting watched and there were guys dropping their bags, but none of the women, at least not in Bravo Company, none of the women dropped their bags. So once you get to that point, I don't care who you are. I don't care what you look like. I don't care who you sleep with. I don't care anything about you Just other don't than drop don't it. drop your bag. And then after a 20-hour day where you get – you might get 2,000 calories if you can eat really, really hot, scalding hot food fast enough. You might get 2,000 calories, but you've been up for 20 hours. You've been physically active the entire 20 hours. Now everybody goes into the barracks and you have three hours to sleep ready go. Nobody cares. Nobody cares if they were sharing a bunk with a woman. Nobody cares about anything. Just we didn't shower together. Other than that, you changed over there. I changed. Like, I don't care. And and it just stopped being important. And there was a couple of people who d either didn't work with me directly, didn't work with one of the women directly, that would come up later on in the field and be like, why are you here? But it wasn't a, hey, you're not pulling your weight. It was Never. more of a you. I mean, you excelled at many of the things. I had definitely, Physically. I definitely had a couple weekdays, but even on those weekdays, everybody has a weekday, and um, you'll hear this from a lot of guys. They'll say, "I mean, my dad went to Ranger School in 1968." He said, "If you were a man and you didn't cry at Ranger School, you're lying." Like everybody broke down at some point in time. And that's the other thing too, right? Because when you read about stuff, you'll hear something about, well, this woman broke down here or this woman fell back in this ruck march. Okay, well, also out of the 68 plus people that were in that platoon or were in that section, like five dudes did as well. Like everybody fails at some point in that school, even the best of the best. So um yeah, so the guys really accepted me quickly. The couple of guys who didn't, it was more of a conversation of, listen, I know my wife, I know my kids, I know my mom, I know my sister. Why would you want to do this? Why are you opening this to women? What if the next step is for women to be um, part of selective service? And my question back to them is, why wouldn't we be? And of course, that's a whole nother discussion and a whole nother debate. But part of it, too, was I wasn't fighting to be in, in combat arms. 
Like that wasn't even my fight at the time. I wanted to go to ranger school because my male peers that were engineer officers were recognized and promoted because of their accomplishments in their career. And they were allowed to go to ranger school and I wasn't. It put me at a disadvantage. And it's not just because of that school. I wanted to be tested and I wanted to have something where I could prove, hey, listen, I'm a cut above. I am the best possible officer I can be. I have taken every opportunity put in front of me to try to make myself the best version of myself. And I'm going to keep pushing. If a door is opened, I'm not stepping through it. I'm diving through it. and Blowing it up. And, and when you have those conversations as you're, you know, burying stuff in the woods or whatever, when you're having these conversations on a one-on-one, the guys will look at you and go, okay, well... I get it. You can do it. But my wife can't. And I'm like, yeah, but your wife isn't here and she doesn't want to be like nobody's forcing guys to come to ranger school and nobody's forcing girls to come to ranger school. And it's also important to highlight what you said. Ranger school is different. It doesn't mean that you're going into combat, right? When an individual graduates ranger school, they can what? Go join a, is it a platoon? It's Or is it not called a platoon? Or you go back to your job. It's not Right. It's not like SEAL selection where they go through right. SEAL training, go through BUDS, then you go through the phases, and then you go to a team right. where you're training for war. This is not what this right? – right. it's different. And even the, the ranger units. The ranger units have people in who haven't completed ranger school yet. So, yes, if you're going to go to a ranger unit or if you want to stay in a ranger unit, you need to go to ranger school. But every infantry officer – has to attend ranger school. And if you don't, it's a career under. And the reason why is it's important to be tested. Can you have bullets, fake or not, flying in your direction, fake kill or real kill? Now, real kill obviously is a whole lot more stressful, but we can't test that. So can we put you in the most stressful environments and can you keep your head? And I think that's really, really important for everyone to test themselves, especially If you're going to be out on convoys, if you're going to be occupying the perimeter, if I'm going to be a a lieutenant and I had 40 plus people in my platoon in Afghanistan, it would have been nice to have tested myself a little bit more before before I got in that position. Before you were in that situation. When you were there, did you feel as if you were going to quit or did you think, okay, if I can just make it through these nine weeks, it's going to be okay because you knew that the end was in sight. There's a certain level of maturity. And then the other aspect of that is what did the other ranger instructors even think of you or were they whispering like, hey, Lisa, good job? Or were they like, get out of here, man? Because I mean, uh, oh, the ranger instructor story is a great one. It's very different than uh, my peers. But to answer your first question about quitting, you know, anyone who says they never thought about quitting is, um, again, probably lying to themselves, which is OK. Sometimes you need to lie to yourself to get through it. I will say um, I remembered a Ronda Rousey quote from UFC, the the TV show Ultimate Fighting Championship. And it's. She was talking to one of her, I'll I'll do the short version. Uh, She was talking to one of her athletes and he was like, I'm just going to drink water. He couldn't make weight for his fight. And she goes, don't let the quit in. And he's like, but I'm not going to make weight anyway. She goes, yeah, but don't let the quit in. And, you know, I thought about that every time my brain went to that negative spot of don't let the quit in, because once you let that in the door, it's always there. Like once you quit one thing, it's easier to quit that second thing, which makes it easier to quit the third thing. So don't let the quit in was one thing that I tried to keep in mind. And then the second thing is, um, I had two friends that I was really, really close with at West Point. And one of them, her dad was a colonel in the army in 06. And he wrote me a letter and said, build your quit criteria, which was a totally different aspect when thinking about quitting. And that's, What are some reasons you could quit where you wouldn't be ashamed? Make that list. And if you if you're going through something and it's not on that list, then you don't get to quit. So I made my list. Death of an immediate family member. That's a good reason to quit and go home. For sure. Compound fracture in my lower body. (laughs) Yep, that, that, pretty, that was pretty it. much that yep. that works yep. because I know that you had a shoulder injury and a yeah, knee injury, but yes. no compound fracture. No compound, okay, but it was fair. very specific, and it was only those two things. I couldn't think of anything else where I could call my mom and be like, 
hey, I quit. And her, her response be, well, I'm proud of you. You tried hard enough. Like you did everything you could. People should deploy that in their own life. A quit, a quick, <laughs> quick criteria. One of those, <laughs> a quit criteria. In fact, I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'm going to come up with a quit criteria. Yeah. I mean, and you can do it with everything. If, with your job. Are you in a miserable job? Um, uh, no. <laughs> I know you're not. <laughs> But, you know, for other people, you're in a miserable job. Are you? How is your relationship? How is, I don't know, like what in your life is something that you think about quitting in? And because it's easy to quit so many things. It's easy to quit a diet. It's easy to quit an mm-hmm. exercise regimen. It's easy to quit so many things. So and once yeah. you quit, you're a quitter. Yeah. You become a quitter. It's there. It's it's there forever. So the quit criteria and the don't let quit, um, don't let the quit in were my two little mantras. But to answer your other question, which is the one that um, it's the hardest for me to answer, because were there ranger instructors that didn't want me to graduate? Hell yes. Hell yes. Because they're more they're old school. Well, they're, I'm, a, I'm yeah, guessing. But if, I'm also trying to invade their community. And I always call it the mystical bro bond. But the hardest thing to deal with for anyone is uncertainty. What happens when you have 10 dudes that love each other like brothers and they always hang out together and now there's a girl who's been pushed in there it completely changes that dynamic and it changes the culture and it's true it does happen but there was a couple things you got to consider chris shea and i the three who graduated in 2015 thank you to cozy earth for sponsoring this episode of the show i have spoken about cozy earth in the past it is amazing Cozy Earth has incredible bedding. These are very soft sheets, breathable. And if you are living in a place like Houston, you definitely need it. But let's say you don't care about temperature regulation, but what you care about is the softness and the coziness of your sheets, which I really do. Cozy Earth is the way to go. You can actually try these sheets for a hundred nights. And if you don't sleep cooler, and you don't sleep better, you can send them back for a full refund. And most importantly, for a limited time only, save up to 40%. You heard that right. 40% discount on Cozy Earth. Go to CozyEarth.com slash Dr. Lion, and you can enter my promo code Dr. Lion at checkout and you will be absolutely thrilled. And by the way, if you need new PJs, they're incredible. Maybe you need some new towels, also incredibly soft. Check out Cozy Earth. Head on over to CozyEarth.com slash Dr. Lion and get some soft, cooler sheets. Are really part of the guys. Like we're really... um Mike Sorelli. Yes. Uh, Hi, talent, Mike. Talent, yeah. Love you, buddy. <laughs> talent War Group. The other day, I'm listening to one of his podcasts, and he's like, yeah, you know, Lisa, she's she's like a dude, but she's just got long hair. And I was like, you know, I I would take offense to that, but it's true, right? I, I've been one of the guys. I've worked construction. I've worked oil and gas. I, I like being around one of the guys. So I don't know that I would change the culture of um, – of an all male unit significantly. To some degree, people would automatically change their behaviors, but I'm still one of the guys. So it would be um, a incremental change maybe. But once that door's open, there's going to be other women that follow me and maybe those other women aren't a Chris, a Shea, or Lisa. So, you know, that their fear is very real. Will the ranger culture change? Yes. Will it be for the worst? I don't know. Will it change everywhere? I don't know. So um, they had a couple that were what we call tab protectors, and they would take their Velcro that's on their shoulder of their uniform, and they would put it over their ranger tab. Now, the joke was, oh, it's so that it doesn't like get caught on a tree branch and get torn off because they're Velcroed on. But let's be honest, that's happened how many times? (laughs) Like tree branches are not coming and stealing your badges. I mean, they guys. could. We are, you know, in 2023. Yeah, it's, we don't, but it's like really a buck 49 at the PX. Like you can go get another one. When, um, when you graduate ranger school, does that do you become a ranger? Does an individual become a ranger? How does that work? I will never refer to myself as a ranger. Okay, I will call myself a ranger school graduate. Ranger school graduate. because there's a difference. I haven't been in a ranger unit. Got it. Um, but I do want to touch back with the the instructors, right? Because the other thing that um, I want to give them grace for is the fact that my classmates completely accepted me because they had to live with me. 
Like they had to deal with me. I was their teammate. Those ranger instructors, they came in for their 24 hour shifts and they went home and they had to read articles in People magazine. They had to listen to congressmen questioning the validity of his being there. They had their buddies who had never seen any of us who didn't know that, you know, um, I've been lifting weights since. You're pretty fit. I mean, I'm not I'm not going to lie. You I could, try. I, I try really hard. <laughs> pretty fit, And you've been pretty fit and you're strong and you're capable. And again, this for you wasn't I'm a woman. I can do it. It was just, well, dude, I need to do dude, it. Dude, why, why can't I go do the same thing everybody else is doing? Right. And right. why can't I test myself in the same way? Yeah. That's important. That's important. So anyway, um, yeah. sidetracked. So, yeah. The- but <laughs> Shiny. But so those instructors had to deal with both worlds. And and I didn't have to deal with that. My classmates didn't have to deal with that. They just had to, we just had to make it through the mission. But they had to go home and get a phone call from their guy friend that they graduated ranger school with 10 years ago going, you ain't gonna let one of those women graduate, are you? So they're caught in this do I let them graduate? Are they earning it? Am I judging them right? Am I judging them too harshly? Am I letting them uh, get away easy because they remind me of an ex-girlfriend. Like they had an emotional aspect that they had to deal with. And and so as much as I started off by saying, for sure, there were RIs that didn't want us to graduate. And there were some RIs that were unprofessional. And I mentioned them in the book. I changed their names. But anyone who was in the class with me, they weren't changed that much. So they they will know exactly who I'm talking about. But um you know, there were those people, but as a whole, these guys were really professional. They were dealing with both sides, people telling them, hey, women have to graduate and people telling them, hey, women should never graduate. And then they were also dealing with the fact that we couldn't, even if we did graduate, we still couldn't be part of the Ranger community. We still couldn't go to Ranger units. So right before graduation, the um, company commanders and the leadership of the Ranger units came and tried to recruit people who were graduating. And they actually said, hey, Ranger Jaster, you just sit there. You, you can't come to us even if you wanted to. I'm like, hmm, okay. You're like, okay. I, I mean, get it. I, you probably weren't looking to do that at that time. I, I wasn't. I really wasn't. You, you know, you have two kids and, and other stuff. What did you learn about yourself? And did you have to really muster up some courage? I think the biggest courage, again, was um, having a family was both my strength and my weakness. Like, it was really hard that I didn't get to teach my daughter how to ride a bike. Um, But it was really awesome that my husband has a really good relationship with my daughter because he was there during those three and four year old stages where she she needed a strong parental influence and he got to be that. So, you know, there's the pluses and minuses. Um, I did learn about one of the main things I learned about myself with regards to that is I had hidden who I was as a mom and a wife until this point. Being a mom was never something I dreamed of. I never wanted, like when I was little, oh, I'm going to get married and have babies. I'm like, well, I'll get married if I, you know, if I find the right guy, maybe. Well, um, obviously I did find the right guy, but being like, I never stressed out about my kids being at daycare. I'm like, yeah, they're probably getting better care there than they would with me. I'm just... I'm just not that nurturer. At Ranger School, I found out I am that nurturer. How? Why? What changed? I I want to be important to them. They're my legacy. And and they hate it now, but when they ask me questions, I'm like, hey, you want the Lisa answer? You want the mom answer? And, and they get the option. What are the, what's the difference? The Lisa answer is if you ask me about asphalt, I'm going to tell you about bitumen and um, – Yes. Yes. If you want the mom answer, I'm going to tell you, well, it's the black stuff over there. So, um, you know, I can I can do either. Not that not that moms don't get in that, but that's how we categorize it in my house. And sometimes the kids answer with the mom preference and sometimes they actually want the Lisa answer. Um, And I'll tell you a story about that later, but it'd be boring for this group. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so I noted I realized that I am probably more of a parent than I ever thought I was was. But I also realized, and this one was a big one for my leadership style, was that men and women, when they're broken down, are not that different. So we all fill roles when you're in a tight unit, whether it's all men or all women, there are things that have to be done. And there are people who automatically step up, male or female, to make sure everybody ate. 
which we would think of as a nurturing characteristic, right? There's also people that the first thing they thought of, no matter what position they were in, was, hey, are we secure here? Um, there were people checking on um, health and feet and, hey, let's make sure everybody's getting their equal amount of sleep. So there was people pulled every role, which identified to me that men and women can work together. We just we just haven't been broken down enough to cast away some of those uh, social requirements. And there were guys that missed their kids more than I missed my kids. There was a guy and I shared a foxhole with him one night and he pulls out an ultrasound that he received in the mail. And we had some laminate that we were supposed to use on our maps and we laminated his ultrasound so that he could carry it in his pocket. But, you know, the only thing in the world he was talking about is going home and holding his wife and being a dad. And and I realized in my business life, because again, I'm a reservist, I only do this part time, I only do army part time. I realized that when I go back to my office, when we're saying, hey, I need you to go on a business trip, well, dads want to coach Little League as much as moms want to coach cheer. So we cannot automatically say that dads have to do all of these things and they have to pull this load while women don't. That being said, I also realized that it's totally cool to have a traditional marriage and have a traditional relationship. And I'm more okay with that now than before I went to ranger school. Now, none of these things sound like lessons from ranger school, but they are leadership lessons is, again, leading that individual. If I have a guy who I'm the primary breadwinner, I want to climb my way to the top of the corporate ladder, my wife is the support structure, great. I can support that as a leader. If I have another employee who comes up to me and he's like, hey, listen, my wife and I are 50-50. This is what I can and cannot do. Great. I can accept that because I saw these guys broken down and realized that as people, we all still have the same hierarchy of needs, right? Do you think there are certain qualities that allow people to succeed in tight, uncomfortable, broken situations? Yes. And I think number one is not assuming the worst out of someone. If someone would, and and to this day, I mean, I got a comment this morning about, um, you know, being a woman and being a fake and being, uh, I'm trying to be something I'm not, whatever, whatever it was, it was, it was hateful. It doesn't make me mad. I just realized, hey, this guy's never met a Lisa Jaster. Maybe I should engage him and see if maybe the issue is he just can't fathom who I am or what I want to do. And um, yeah, there's a there's a way to bring people around, I guess. Not- mm. Interesting. When I think about success, I often think about right, discipline and execution, but I don't know if I've often thought about the other aspects, meaning, you know, do we need to not make assumptions or how do we operate? I'm sure you saw certain qualities in people over time when they were, obviously when you were in ranger school, that these are the type of people that will continue to succeed and then these are the type of people or qualities that won't. Did you see that? Yeah, I'll use a great example, right? So um, we do these um, walk to the sunrise so you start out on a mission, you do everything I explained earlier. Stop by Starbucks. Yeah, yeah. no Starbucks on the way. Maybe fill your water bottle in a stream and throw an iodine tablet in there. It's about as brown as coffee. So it's, uh, it's, it's uh, side of Giardia. Yeah. yeah, no big deal. So you do that and then a second mission will come. And then next thing you know, you are not sleeping. You walk, you get to your patrol base, and then you start planning the very, very next day. So you have no time to sleep. You have to eat, and you're eating your dinner as you arrive. And then because you're starting your next day, you eat your breakfast. So you eat two MREs per day, but they're at the exact same time. I mean, that's so 2,500 right. calories. One meal a day. All at the same time. So you're doing that. And you know, being that person who doesn't get their feelings hurt – I'm in a leadership position. I'm just going to yell at you because I don't have time to say, hey, how was your walk? Are your feet feeling okay? I have to say, hey, listen, I need you to do these 17 things and you have to do them in order and you have to do them right. And I have to walk away and I'm not going to, I'm going to check up on you later. And if you fail, then we both fail. And I have to leave. And then the next night when you're in leadership, 
you have to be that same way with me. But then we still have to like each other. So you can't get offended by it. And then you add in the dynamic of being female or, you know, we didn't have a lot of African Americans in our group. Um, you don't have a lot of guys with glasses. Nobody's heavy set, you know. So if you had a, a thicker guy or you had somebody with glasses, there's all these things that um, make you different. Well, if somebody calls you four eyes, you could get ticked off. You could have a bad day about it, or you could glance over it and work together. So if you're going to have an effective team when you're broken down, like your original question is you have to have a bunch of people that are okay with, hey, I'm, I'm going to say something and it's not going to be polite and sweet, or I need you to take it the way I mean it, not the way I said it. Um, and and right now in society, that's one of the reasons why our, our tight-knit communities are becoming tighter is because we're comfortable. I can say some things to my military friends that if I said them publicly, people would think I'm horrible, but that's just effective communication with my military friends. Um, and I think if our society got a little bit more okay with, hey, I know that you didn't mean it as a slander to say that I'm a chick or whatever. Um, I know you're just questioning your... Um, Con misconceptions or conceptions, your beliefs. If I know that by calling me a, a girl or questioning my capability, you're really just challenging what you know. If I think of it that way, then I can't get offended. Then I can work with you. It's pretty evolved. I mean, that's a, a pretty evolved framework of thinking. I'm sure you got backlash from uh, this. Oh, yeah. And did it affect you? Did it get under your skin? And how do you recommend people even navigate. Again, we live in a very public world now in a way that we didn't live before. Yeah. And and I did. I got a lot of backlash and it did get under my skin. And it wasn't getting under my skin because of the accusations towards me. It got under my skin because they're questioning the military that I love. I'm 45 years old. I decided to join the military when I was 11. So for 34 years, my heart and soul has thought the army is the place for me. Even when I got out, I missed it. And I thought service, everybody should serve. Of course, I would never force it on anyone. But I can't, I can't conceive of somebody not wanting to serve their country, especially if you're an American, like God bless America. And, you know, as cheesy as all of that sounds, um, what offended me is that people weren't just questioning me, they weren't just questioning the school, they were questioning any ranger instructor who worked with me and changed their mind. They were questioning all of my male peers who were like, hey, Lisa, can you be my team leader today? Because I know you'd be on point as um, for land navigation. Like I know you'd be awesome at that. So, so they're questioning the integrity of the system and they're questioning integrity of people. And that would get me so fired up. And it took me a long time to realize that a lot of them just didn't know someone like me. Yes, I do like going hunting. Yes, I like room service, but I do like going hunting. And we only eat things that we've killed in my house, except for maybe once a week because we don't have a lot of fish at home and I got to eat, you know, you got to balance diet a little Trying bit. To yeah, yeah. Diversify. But it is a really evolved way of thinking about it that it's probably that they just don't understand you. And I think that that's giving a lot of credit to potentially people. But once you made that decision, were you able to move off that X or move uh, off that? No, Wait. I love the term moving off the axe. Yeah, I was just thinking that's our buddy, Jason Redman. Yes. Um, I just read his book. It's amazing, yes. by the way. <laughs> we love you, Jay. Were you able to compartmentalize that? I was until my son got his YouTube account. And he read comments. And so I manage all of his social media accounts. I, I mean, he does whatever he wants on them. I don't. I don't. You monitor them. I don't actually monitor. I post for him because he forgets to post and he wants to play college sports. So there needs to be a backlog of videos of him wrestling and football and pole vaulting. So I post. I don't read any Sounds of his comments. Like a real underachiever. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm I'm trying to help him with those straight A's and not uh, not that I'm bragging. I'm totally bragging. Um, but as you should. Yeah. We well, were talking about this before. Yeah. But. I'm proud of my little ginger. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> so. Ah, uh, focus, Lisa. So, um, but YouTube, he doesn't do anything with. It's just a way for him. And I want him to have an account while he's 15 living in my house so he can make those stupid mistakes before they're permanent, right? 
Good choice. So I like him being on social media. Well, when he watched a video of me and had to read comments, um, it was really hard. He he replied, and he replied super professionally and way more professionally than I thought uh, any 14-year-old would. But some guy was really hitting hard on the fact that I'm a liar and a cheat and a fake and no woman's ever done this. And this is, you know, BS. And he just, you don't know my mother. You don't know the time she puts in the gym. You don't see her up at 430 Jack and Steel while you're like, it was really, really professional. But that's when it bothers me is when my kids have to defend me. Now, my husband, he's always going to have to defend me. He's six foot nine, like, Nobody's messing with him. All he has to do is say, come meet me for coffee and everybody backs down. But when my kids shouldn't have to defend me. And, and so that does make my blood boil sometimes. But other than that, you found that you were just totally inoculated to the criticism and is... I'm not that good, um, but I do... Uh, I do make a point to get to engage. And so I will look Why? for those comments. Why? Because you don't change people But why even give the them your time? time? But why... But- you that takes a lot of effort and energy to engage with people that potentially will never change their mind i know that you feel that they they may yeah. but why so let's let's take it a different way um there was a guy at panda express my kids love panda express um only orange chicken and i think we got all the orange chicken and there was this guy behind us and i was buying for my kids and there were a couple other kids with us and so i was buying for a bunch and and this guy behind us in line just said are you buying for me too and we went back and forth for a little bit well he got to the checkout counter and we had bought his i mean whether i'm buying for five people or six people at this point it's panda express it's not going to break the bank and the guy was just like overwhelmed at the fact that I bought his like $4 chicken. And so we have this pay it forward concept, right? Like his mood completely changed from when he was in line to when he left Panda Express on some random Saturday. So now he's going to go home and he's going to be in a better mood. And it's that whole pay it forward concept, right? So maybe he's nice to five people who are nice to five people who are nice to five people. Well, that's what I'm doing. And every time I reach out to somebody, I might not change their mind, but somebody on social media, somebody's going to read that comment. Part of it's I don't want that rubbish hanging out there without being checked. Like that's part of it. Like, hey, Fair. listen, you, can, you can't accuse me of, be, of um, being a liar or a cheat without getting checked a little bit. But on the flip side, I want other people to see that. I want other people to read it. Um, but I had a guy, and I'll use this example, and I went back and forth with him for a while. And it got heated enough that he took it offline and was instant messaging me. And fast forward six months, his daughter comes home from second grade bawling her eyes out because it was career day at school. And she had drawn a picture that she wanted to be a police officer at school. And the boys in her class made fun of her because police are boys. Girls can't be cops. And she's like, Daddy, I didn't know I couldn't be a police officer. That's what I really want to be. And he reached out to me and he goes, how do I deal with this? There's no women in my life that want to do these kind of things. How do I talk to my daughter? How do I support her? I don't want to tell my daughter. And I kind of wrote back the same stuff you told me. (laughs) And but I just can't believe he had the audacity to reach out to you after all of that. But but that's why I put myself out there because yeah. there people don't know. People don't know someone like me. People don't know someone like you. You know, we are we are not typical. And but nobody's typical. So I want to be available so that maybe somebody's mind will change and if that person's mind doesn't change, maybe someone um Maybe there's a secondary exposure or a tertiary exposure. Maybe somebody goes, looks at those comments that my son made in five years on, uh, I think it was Combat Story, and say, oh, my God, look at this young man sticking up for his wife. This woman and her husband are raising a great kid. They must be doing something right. Let me look at some of the other things they've done. Oh, my goodness. Here we go. Where do you think that all this is going in terms of... Uh, just how we begin to think about these things. Because again, this is not really a male-female kind of a thing. It's just if you're capable of doing it, you should have the opportunity to do it. I think we've gotten so hung up on adjectives in our culture today. We are so wanting to put people in boxes. That's what that's why we're seeing the polarization we're seeing. We've got people who want to fight the system and we've got people who want to build the system up. And I think 
the concept of deleting the adjective will bring us back to merit-based. I don't care what you do with your life. You can express yourself however you want. You can look the way you want. You can um, manipulate your body. You can get earrings, tattoos. I don't care what you do. I'm glad you approved that part. <laughs> well, I love your tattoos. Yeah. I'm super <laughs> jealous of them, but I don't think my – yeah, I don't know that it would look as good on me. But, you know, you do whatever you do you want to do, but are you value added? And I think if we get back to the, are you value add? Can we have a good conversation? Can we build on um, what you bring to the table and what I bring to the table? When we get back to that discussion, all of these hurt feelings will go away because we're not focused on that anymore. The adjectives don't become important. And I'll talk about, um, I'll use the example of homosexuality, right? It was such a big deal. I remember in the 90s joining the army and don't ask, don't tell and being gay. It was just, man, do you think she's gay? Like it was this thing we whispered in corners and and now who cares? Like, does it affect me one way or the other who you sleep with? Okay, well, we need to mature past some other things that we're whispering about in corners now because it's all about what you bring to the table. Are you combat effective? Our military specifically has got to be merit based. And life has to be merit. -based. Yes. Yes. I, but I talk about it in the book. There's 140 pound males who can't deadlift 345. That's my deadlift. So does that mean that because I'm a woman, I shouldn't be able to do certain jobs and he's a male, even if he's weaker than me? Or is deadlifting a requirement? Is strength a requirement? What are the job requirements? And I could probably talk on that for the next two hours. I mean, there are some great <laughs> uh, parts in the book. You talk about how um, as at 145 pounds, you have to carry, how much was it? They have to be able to carry a 200 pound yeah. soldier out. But the same wasn't, were, was that across the board for all soldiers? Right. And my husband always loves that. He goes, I'm 260 pounds and six foot nine. Because the example that got, gets used quite frequently is, if my husband's in a tank and the tank starts on fire, you're not going to be able to pull him out. And my husband straight up, nobody can do that. <laughs> like, if you tied him to a crane and pulled him out, if you've ever seen a man in kit, you're not dragging him out of the top quickly. Like, it just doesn't work. And maybe there's some world somehow where somebody could do it. But look across our, our armed forces. That's that's not what we need. We're not looking for the guy who can figure out that specific issue. We're looking for a whole person who can be value add. And sometimes that value add is brute strength. And therefore, the requirements need to be brute strength tests. Sometimes it's academic prowess. Mm -hmm. Like, no matter how strong or weak you get, it's your brain that I want to be uh, sharp as could be. Like that's the sword you need to keep sharp. And all the rest is just is, is just a cherry on top. Where and how did this change your life? Thank you to one of my absolute favorite companies for sponsoring this episode of the show, Timeline Nutrition. I am telling you, I talk all about muscle-centric medicine, muscle as the organ of longevity, and what comes with muscle, mitochondria. And MitoPure helps our mitochondria produce energy more efficiently by triggering our body's natural cellular renewal process, replacing damaged mitochondria with fresh new ones, and addressing the energy challenge at its source. Your body is an energy generating machine. Timeline makes it more powerful. I have been using Timeline in my clinic. The people and patients that are on MitoPure, they feel it. It is one of the most effective supplements. This is one of the most thoroughly researched products that I have come across with over a decade of peer reviewed published science. Very important. If you are on board with this idea of a muscle centric lifestyle, then head on over to TimelineNutrition.com slash Dr. Lion. That's TimelineNutrition.com slash Dr. Lion, and you will get 10% off your order. I recommend trying their starter pack with all three formats. Ranger School or just this? Yeah. I mean, I know this yeah. podcast is great. It's probably life-changing. It is. It is. <laughs> um, where, yeah, how did Ranger School change your life? Because it, it probably put you on a different trajectory. It certainly catapulted you into the public eye, which I don't know if anyone is ever ready for that. Right. Um, yeah. How did it change you? It was, um, 
it definitely changed my career. Like it was very hard. It's very difficult to be an engineer doing project management and and having this big message I want to share. I think the the best part of this is I have a platform and I'm I'm able to use that platform to have this discussion. Let's be merit based. I don't care if you're male or female, if you're not strong enough or you're not smart enough, I don't want you. Um in certain positions, I'm able to to have a voice on that. Um, the other thing is, you really learn what teammates are like, and and who's got your back. And going into the public eye is an amazing way and a horrible way to to clear the chaff from from maybe a a lifetime of friends and and see who's really supportive. And I didn't know how blessed I was. Until I did get in the public eye and I literally had people calling me that I hadn't spoken to in 20 years saying, hey, listen, I disagree with all of this, but I got your back. If you need me, let me know. Um, we can argue about it publicly or privately, but, you know, you're still my friend. We've still did homework projects together once upon a time. And those are the friends I need. And and I want people who disagree with me. Um, I never want to be yelling in an echo chamber. And that's another thing that becoming more public and graduating ranger school has helped me understand is the people I value in my life are also the people who don't necessarily agree with me. Those are probably the most valuable. Yeah. It's just the, the way that it goes. What are you doing now? You said it changed your career. I mean, I know these answers, but I would love for you to, <laughs> yes. to share them. So I'm a partner with Talent War Group. Um, so we're an executive search firm. We also, um, in the part I work in is we do uh, a lot of talent management. So we do uh, leadership workshops, leadership development, executive coaching. I also do a lot of keynote speaking. Um, I like to focus more on the leadership and the team building side. But also I speak about going to Ranger School, which I always try to loop back into proper team building, leveraging merit, all of that good stuff. But yeah, so keynote speak, speaking, executive coaching, and then leadership workshops is really where I'm focused. What's your favorite? Um. I think the leadership workshops, because I actually get to peel the onion, especially if I go into a specific company, get to peel the onion on the issues within that company and really work with people because your leadership style is not the same as my leadership style. Your organization is not the same as my organization. So there's no one size fits all. You can't read a leadership book and walk back into work the next day and be like, Eureka, I've got it. It doesn't work that way. So when you do a workshop, I can find out about the culture of your organization. And if you're a family based or a team based organization, or you're hierarchical, okay, those are all great. How do we work and build within that? And it really is a, a puzzle. And as an engineer, I love searching out problems and trying to find solutions. And it's always a collaboration. And it's something that's long lasting. It could be a four hour workshop, but it's months of prep time before and usually a relationship that's indefinite at the far end. So leadership workshops is really where I'm happy. I asked you what makes a good leader, but perhaps I should have asked you what makes a good team. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me. Yeah. Uh, I talk a lot about up leadership because people seem to think, hey, if I'm an individual contributor, I need to contribute at my level. The problem is that old school thought process of I'm going to work hard for 20 years. Somebody's going to notice me and I'm going to get raises and promotions in accordance with my hard work doesn't really work anymore. Um, you have to you have to manage around you. And I don't mean manage in a slimy way. I mean, if your teammates don't know what you're doing, then are you value added to the team? If you're keeping information or you're driving really hard on whatever you're working on, but you're not sharing and you're not collaborating, are you really working as part of a team? If you're not up managing, if your supervisor doesn't know what you're doing or when you're doing it or how you're doing it or what resources you're using, again, are you really um, adding the value that you could could add. So I think a, a great team are people that are willing to collaborate, but also work independently. And that independent work is, I know what the team needs. I'm going to do it without being told or asked, but I'm also going to share that I'm going to do it. And we see this a lot in the engineering world. Uh, people keep things and the military does it sometimes too. Hey, if I own this, then I'm important. And that might be my 
my avenue to success. Well, share, hey, this is what I'm working on. If you have any great ideas, that's fine. If not, I really, I'm a subject matter expert here. I'm going to plug away. I'm going to push hard on this. If anybody has anything ancillary to it, let me know because we probably at some point in time need to mesh our efforts together. Do you find that there's one thing that destroys a team? It's usually when people get sensitive and not not sensitive for sensitive for the wrong reasons. So um, one thing I used when I was in battalion command is I had a lot of personalities that were given to me and people would fight. And I said, well, do you really think he hates you? No. OK, but he talks to me like this. OK, I he shouldn't. But did you listen to him with it? I'll use, you know, fake names, Bob and Sue. Did you listen to Bob with Bob ears on? What does that mean? Okay. When Bob says, I need this by five, and he doesn't do anything else but give you that directive, he's being crass. Bob doesn't think he's being crass. Bob thinks he's being efficient and he doesn't want to waste your time. In his head, he's being respectful. So Bob will come into my office. Oh, my God. She takes up so much. Sue takes up so much of my time. She's always wanting to complain. She's always wanting to do this. Okay, did you listen to Sue with your Sue ears? And, you know, the answer is, what are Sue ears? Well, Sue thinks you don't understand where she's at or where she's going. So she's trying to explain it so that you can give her guidance. Sue needs more guidance. Listen to Sue with her Sue ears, with your Sue ears. She's asking for guidance. Bob's asking for efficiency. Sue's asking for guidance. Oh, my gosh. When I say that, they're like, oh, yeah, we can totally work together. So when you're being when you don't understand that the other person is coming at an issue from a slightly different angle, that's when teams fall apart because the assumption is he's being rude or she's being whiny or, you know, whatever the the negative terminology would be. That's very valuable. I think everybody listening to this podcast is absolutely going to come away a better person. You highlight some really important things. And I I love that about you. Again, it is really based on merit. And I feel like your life and your drive and just how you show up is is about being the best version of yourself. And that's very inspiring, whether you are male or female. I think you have a lot of great things to say. I strongly suggest that everybody follows you and I will share your book. I I think I've already shared it, but I'm going to share it again. And I'm just, I'm so grateful to know you, to be your friend and I'm in full support. I just, I think you're the best. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. This was awesome. (laughs) 